With me now, Canada's ambassador to Ukraine, Larissa Galadza, along with Ukraine's ambassador to Canada, Yulia Kovalev. Hello to both of you ambassadors. Thank you very much for making the time today. Uh, ambassador Kovalev, I'll start with you. And just wanted to get a sense from you of how significant the vote at the UN this afternoon is from your perspective. Today, we have 141 countries who supported the resolution uh, that actually uh, support the peace formula of President Zelensky. And that is important for us that um, majority of the countries, the bigger majority of the countries, uh, with the support of Ukraine, showed not only the solidarity, but also they supported this 10 points plan of President Zelensky uh, that include both the full restoration of the uh, territorial integrity of Ukraine, uh, important thing about the nuclear security, food security, but also another important thing that is justice. Because for us, it's both important to end the war with uh, keeping all of the Ukrainian territory within Ukraine and also to bring the justice after the war. Uh, Ambassador Galadza, uh, I've listened to a number of leaders reflect on, on the marking of the one-year anniversary this week, starting off, of course, with Joe Biden, U.S. President Joe Biden in Ukraine over the weekend. And uh, what I keep hearing over and over is the degree to which allies are unified in their support of Ukraine and their rebuke, really, of Russia. Does the vote at the U.N. today underscore that for you? Absolutely, it does. Uh, and I think it comes uh, in a week uh, where the world needs to hear this message and Ukrainians need to hear this message. I consistently hear from Ukrainians that what allows them to keep going is the hope that they get because they haven't been left alone. The hope that they have because we are here with them physically in terms of the financial and humanitarian and, and military uh, support that we have provided over over the course of the last year in the visits that we've had in the past week including from Canada's foreign minister and uh, and then today this 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 really important signal from from the general assembly uh, ambassador um, uh, Kovalev on uh, uh, yes it was 141 countries who voted in favor uh, there were also vote countries I think we would expect to vote in uh, alongside Russia but then there are some who abstained and significantly you know countries like China like India, who have uh, tried to navigate this as a so-called, um, you know, on the so-called side of neutrality. Is there, is, does such a thing exist from, from where you sit? We see some of the countries that still are in neutrality and we are talking actively to many of them. We also see some countries who abstained last time and were in support of Ukraine this time. And that is part of our big diplomatic effort to knock to those countries and to explain that this is the uh, black and white situation where abstaining is actually supporting the aggressor. And with getting more and more support and talking and also engaging with our partners, especially to the countries with the global south, um, as we are trying to explain them that the big issue of food security is something what Russia created and forced by invading Ukraine. And this is where these countries, and specifically the low-income countries in, uh, in the African continent, suffer and their people suffer. Uh, although these countries are far away in terms of the distance from Ukraine, but the impact of the war, especially on the food security and the peak prices for food that we were witnessing last year was the direct consequences of Russian invasion. And so it's a, for the benefit of these countries and for the benefit of people, global economic growth, this to stand with Ukraine and support us. I think Ambassador Kovalev makes a good point, uh, Ambassador Galadza, about uh, some countries migrating positions. But when you think about countries like China and Iran, where there are very real concerns at this moment that they aren't really neutral, they may be abstaining, but they may also be considering or already supporting Russia in, in its efforts uh, to uh, wage war on Ukraine. Uh, how concerned from, from Canada's perspective um, are you about that and about what I mean, I mean, President uh, Putin announced a visit from President Xi Jinping uh, to Russia in, in the future. How, how much does that worry you? 
I think that we've always been worried about anything that could make this war go on longer. Uh, and so uh, we watch these things closely and the entire network of Canadian diplomats around the world uh, is working to do, as Ambassador Kovalev said, to shift uh, shift from support to abstention, uh, support for Russia to, uh, to to through abstention to support for for Ukraine, uh, and so so we're 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 seeing that happen, and uh, and and this is going to be uh, this is this is long term work. Um, when we talk about the the form that that support takes, Ambassador Kovalev, the last time I think you were sitting in that chair, we were discussing the possibility of tanks being supplied to Ukraine and the hesitancy of Germany at that point and your belief that allies would eventually come together and, and supply those. That, that did come to fruition. Now the conversation has migrated to what President Zelensky has said is most needed for the next phase of this war, the counteroffensive in the spring, and that is fighter jets. Um, I spoke to Poland's ambassador the other night who said, uh, we're willing to supply them, but we are not, and, and sort of delineating from the tank situation, we are not willing to do it alone. Are you concerned about the prospect for allies getting on the same page with fighter jets, or do you anticipate it will turn out just like the tanks? Vashi, we, f through this year uh, of war, we went through was a different kind of the weapons from the messages of our partners that never, it's too complicated, Ukrainians have not been trained, they don't know how to use these weapons, to supplying these weapons. Uh, it was the same with NATO standard artillery, armed vehicles, that was with the same with tanks. And now we understand that uh, how to work, how to talk and how to explain, because we very openly explain to our partners, especially uh, from the, our defense side, uh, ministers are talking uh, and uh, diplomats are talking and explain why we need this. And uh, I'm very optimistic as well for the fighter jets. It just needs more time. The same story was with Leopard tanks. The Germany was saying that they will, they will supply them if any other country will supply them. Uh, then the UK government made first decision to supply NATO standard tanks. And then US announced that they will supply tanks. And then Germany announced. And then um, Canada announced. And many other countries joined the tank coalition. So now the next, our effort is to persuade and just explain why we need them. Because Russian missiles are still flying over Ukrainian territory and hit critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Our air is still not protected. And in order to be able to liberate the territories, to prepare and be able to move to counteroffensive operations, we need also the air shield. A Ambassador Galadza, you're, you're in Kyiv. You would be uh, acutely aware of exactly what Ambassador Kovalev just laid out. Do, do you understand the point that Ukraine is making that they need those fighter jets? Are you sympathetic to that point? I'm sympath very sympathetic to Ukrainians who say they, that if we give them the tools, they will uh, they will finish the job. Uh, and, uh, and, and and the discussions uh, started last year in a very, very different place, and we've seen the same story repeat itself uh, throughout the year, where allies, Ukraine's closest partners, have done what's, uh, w what was necessary, uh, and, uh, and that's where we are today. And this is, this, the, the discussion on fighter jets is, is, is today's discussion. If I could follow up with you, Ambassador Gladza, on that, um, and, and I don't pretend to say that Canada has an arsenal, we, we know very, very well, an arsenal of fighter jets to lend. But in other instances where we didn't have the equipment, for example, a missile defense system, Canada purchased one for Ukraine. Are there active conversations in the government of Canada about how it can be part of the conversation around supplying fighter jets to Ukraine? Canada's a really active participant in the Ramstein group uh, of, of, I think, over 40 countries now that regularly gets together uh, uh, with uh, the Ukrainian defense minister and military leadership to understand what Ukraine needs. And then those 40 countries very much work together to, uh, to optimize uh, what they have and to, uh, to answer Ukraine's requests. Do you see, though, uh, Canada playing a role specifically in the request around fighter jets? Those requests all go back to Ottawa with Minister Anand, who participates in those discussions, and I know that she then has discussions in Ottawa. Absolutely. Okay, Ambassador Kovalev, last word to you, and I'm just going to jump off of what Ambassador Galadza said there. Uh, do you see Canada playing a role? I, again, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to pretend that, that we have a lot of fighter jets, but like I said, there have been other instances where Canada kind of got creative. 
I, is the we, ask of your uh, of Ukraine for Canada to be involved in that discussion in the next phase of the war? First of all, Vashi, you've said very rightly Canada has been first very supportive, that second very creative, and Canada joined all the uh, so-called military equipment coalitions that Ukraine created and advocated for. Uh, what is in reality how this dialogue is built, that the countries to whom we are talking in Canada is uh, active uh, participants in those talks, uh, try to find the place where a country can do uh, the most effective things. Where, uh, when it comes to Canada, Canada has been supportive, uh, especially on the armed vehicles, on the artillery, on the tanks. Um, and so we are trying to find now this place, how to make it uh, most efficient out of our discussion for the fighter jets. And this conversation is now going among many of the, the allies, because mostly we are talking about F-16 fighter mm -hmm. jets. Uh, uh, that is what Canada does not have. Uh, so that, but the the window for any creative decision, Ukraine, of course, will appreciate. I'm sure. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much, ambassadors Kovalev and Galadza. I really appreciate you making the time on such an important day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.